do today. Um, and I know there's probably a varied uh, breadth of knowledge here. Some people um, may as, may all be new, and other people may know more than I do. So, you know, we can share and we can all learn. So, uh, understanding uh, evapotranspiration, uh, plant soil water relationship, really important. Um, about plant placement, uh, managing water. I'm a big proponent of managing water. In our state association, we have a certified water manager program, and I'm certified in that. And that's basically after the, the system is in, uh, how much to water, how often, what type of system. Um, that's what this uh, certification is focused on, and I think that's where we can save the most water. No matter what system you have and um, what type of plants, um, the management of that is probably the thing that's going to impact the water usage the most. Uh, become familiar with how to, to save water while improving plant health, learn how to reduce and eliminate runoff, and uh, understand the different types of irrigation systems. So those are uh, our objectives. And we'll kind of dive right into evapotranspiration. Uh, basically, it's a couple of words combined, evaporation and transpiration. Evaporation is pretty straightforward. Sun comes out, gets warm, moisture gets lost uh, up into the atmosphere. Uh, transpiration, a little bit more complicated, but the plant uses transpiration to move water, nutrients, uh, sugars, all kinds of things throughout the plant, and in doing so, it loses moisture. And as you probably know, that uh, Tropical plants generally have really big leaves, and drought tolerant plants really have small leaves. And the whole idea is in a tropical situation, there's rain very frequently um, and abundant, so um, um, it's easy for them that they don't have to worry about losing so much moisture. But you get into the drought tolerant plants, you see leaves with hairs on them and much smaller and lighter in color so that they don't heat up as much, and, and that's a way to conserve. So, what affects uh, transpiration? Uh, the, the, the temperature, wind, definitely. I mean, what happened here in the last couple of days? I, mean, it was, I, I, I felt it yesterday. I really got dehydrated. I mean, it just, you know, we're not used to that. It's been quite a while since we had that kind of weather. Uh, and the plant feels the same way, I guarantee it. Uh, of course, humidity, uh, what we're talking about, plant type and avoid available soil moisture. And the reason I say available soil moisture is because there can be water in the soil that's not available to the plant. And especially like in heavy soils, clay soils, there can be lots of water in the soil, but the plant cannot get to it. So, uh, plants with water. So this relationship uh, is really important, uh, as, as we all know. That, you know, plant doesn't have enough water, it gets to a point where we call permanent wilting point. Anybody uh, familiar with the term permanent wilting point? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. That's a critical point, right? Uh, generally, we don't want to uh, we don't want to get to that point because it gets expensive to start replacing plants. Uh, so we have all these different. Uh, Types of plant material, tropicals, uh, Mediterranean. We are in a Mediterranean area, uh, which I think is wonderful because uh, some of the most beautiful plants are Mediterranean plants. A lot of Medi most Mediterranean plants are drought tolerant. Uh, natives. Uh, what people don't always understand is not all natives are drought tolerant. Uh, I mean, a lot of people think a sycamore tree is drought tolerant because it's a native, but where do you see sycamore trees growing? Right here, right here, and, and, and directly, I've seen them water running right over the trunk. I mean, there's not too many trees that can do that, but that's one of them. So just because it's native doesn't mean it's drop pollen. Uh, hydrozoning. Uh, the importance of uh, making sure that you have uh, matched water needs. Really important in design. Of course, the exposure. Um, a lot of people don't think about that. Like, let's say they want a lawn area. If you're going to plant that lawn area on the south side of the house, it's going to use a lot more water than, than let's say, on the east side of the house or the north side. You've got to make sure there's enough light for whatever type of turf you're planting. But at the same time, 
you know, if you're going to do a water conserving garden, wouldn't it make sense to not put it in the hottest spot in the yard? Because it's the highest water consumer typically. So if if it's got a, it's a must have for the client, then then let's limit the size and let's put it in a, in a place where it will use less water. Um, exposure, uh, as we talk about vegetables. Uh, I, I grow, I'm an avid vegetable gardener and a fruit tree grower. Yeah. And I, I just love growing my own food. Uh, yeah, it takes some water. Uh, and I, I choose that over turf. I don't have any turf, but I got <laughs> this. Um, and then, uh, of course, pots. The reason I put pots on there because people don't think about it. I, I haven't watered my garden for three months, not a drop. And I haven't turned on the water yet, although I'm very close to, but I have watered my pots, especially hanging baskets. If anybody has any hanging baskets, if you haven't watered them in the last week or two, uh, unless they're, you know, cactus or something really dry, call it. Right. But, you know, this is, if you think about it, uh, a pot is one thing. The reason a pot has to be watered so much more frequently than something in the ground is because it's... Its root structure is confined and it's exposed to, to the outside. And then that pot can be hit by sun, wind. It, you know, when it's down in the ground, that's that's like insulation. That's a, a huge difference. And so what I do is, uh, all, my whole system is shut down, but I'll run the, the pot. So I'll just turn on. The, I have a drip system that runs them. I run it for one one and a half minutes, shut it off, and and they're good. So it doesn't use much water, but it needs it frequently. A lot of people make the mistake of putting pots on a irrigation system that's tied in with other things. Right. And uh, I, I find that to be a really bad idea because, uh, again, pots need water so much more often and they need only a very small amount because it starts to run out of the bottom of the pot. You try doing that and combining that with any other system and you're either going to be overwatering one thing or underwatering another. Yes. So you didn't water, you haven't watered your vegetables in, in, That's right. in three months? That's right. Wow. wow. Now I have, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know how I do that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I mean, it's the soil type I have and, and it's all about the mulch. Um, you can go to my house right now, remove the mulch, and it's wet. And it has not been watered for three months. Now we did have rain, of course. And that, that's the only reason I've been able to do that is because we've had rain. But what happens is when we get rain, I don't let the rain go away. I don't let it, it doesn't evaporate from the fat line. And it doesn't run off my property. It stays right where it belongs. In fact, I'm able to collect water from neighboring property on the line and, and conserve that as well. But normally it would just run down the street. Uh, so, draw tolerant plants, uh, as we talk about, uh, Mediterranean climate generally is it's based on uh, the, the the conditions that, uh, you know, that there's a lot of sun exposure and not a lot of rainfall. Um, and typically doesn't get too, too cold. You know, there, there's a limit. As we talked about before, natives, not all natives are drought tolerant. Uh, high water use, uh, tropicals, vegetables, fruit trees, pots, cool season turf, and vines. Um, back years ago when the economy really went south, um, there was a lot of foreclosed homes, and what you probably noticed, and, and I definitely noticed, is the amount of, you know, because usually what happens is the meter gets locked, so there's no water at all. And what do you see? Uh, what's amazing is what you see is most of the landscape of a typical traditional landscape survives. What happens? The lawn dies, anything in a pot dies, generally most vines die, um, but the, uh, the trees and the, uh, the mature shrubs, they, they don't seem to be too phased. Yeah, maybe they, they don't look as good, but they don't die. Uh, they're used to, a great example was that there was a really big nursery on Black Mountain Road, and they went out of business, and they had bougainvilleas planted, mature bougainvilleas planted all along the road, probably for a mile. And those plants actually, I think, looked better <laughs> after they weren't getting any water. And it was years and years and years before they developed that property that those bougainvilleas thrived. <coughs> and that's, you know, they were probably getting water two, three times a week when the nursery was there. Then they only got rainwater 
for years, and they looked great. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the maturity of a plant, and especially with the type of plant, it really needs little or no water in addition to the rainwater that we get. So water management. Um, we're going to talk about the different types of irrigation systems, how we can apply water to the soil. Um, so proper water management, as, as I've said, I, I think it's the most powerful tool. There's lots of great innovations with smart controllers and moisture sensors, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the weather stations, all of that is wonderful. But I'll tell you, I've installed a lot of uh, systems that were super efficient. But the client or the gardener isn't familiar with it and over waters. So you can, you know, it's sort of like uh, having a, a really fuel efficient car, but all you do is put the pedal to the metal every time you get into it. I mean, you know, you're kind of defeating the purpose. So um, that's why I'm saying it's uh, the water management is it's the least expensive uh, and the most effective tool. Not that you don't want an efficient system, you, you definitely do. Um, but I think the impact is so much greater by the person that's actually programming the irrigation controller. That's the one who's ultimately in charge of how much water you save. <coughs> um, so irrigation efficiency. Uh, what's amazing and most people don't realize is that um, conventional spray systems, <coughs> if they're installed properly, are about 55% efficient. Wow. Which means 45% of the water does not get used by the plant. Okay. Now, the reason I'm such a big proponent of drip irrigation because now we're up into the 90%. So, you know, automatically, you're going to save a lot of water just based on that one fact. And then rotor heads are somewhere in between. So, um, you know, once you calculate how much water your plant needs, you still got to understand the efficiency of the irrigation system because you have to put that much more water on it. The irrigation is only if your plant's only getting half of the water that the system puts in, that means you've got to put twice as much water as what the plant requires, just so it gets what it needs. Um, so, um, and then understanding the requirements. Um, what's One of the things that uh, used to drive me a little crazy is when the mayor of San Diego would get on, the, on a commercial on the radio or in the newspaper and he would say, okay, everybody should be watering three days a week. <laughs> and I was watering one day a week. And I'm thinking, all oh, the people that were watering one day a week are now going to start to water three days a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, the challenge in, in irrigation and <coughs> plants and water is that it's not a black and white answer. I have people ask me, how often should I water? And of course, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> uh, there's, it's just, it's so complicated. Uh, and, and we're going to go through that. Uh, I think once you get a good gist of understanding, you'll be much closer than hopefully where you were before. Uh, but there's a lot of things to keep in mind. Uh, exposure, like we talked about, what side of the house it's on, is it under a tree, is it uh, out in uh, full sun, is it uh, a half day, location, not just location in the yard, but where's the home? Um, we have projects that we maintain in Del Mar, and we have projects that we maintain in Ramona. It's absolutely night and day in water usage. I mean, I, I live in Escondido, and there's been days where it's 30 degrees difference in temperature between Escondido and the coast. 70 degrees on the coast, 100 degrees in Escondido. That's about as, as extreme as it gets, but how, how would you figure, you know, when we have our maintenance crews, we, we let them know about programming, and that's different programming for coastal versus inland valley. Uh, plant type, of course, we talked about that. Uh, tropicals versus natives versus uh, Mediterranean. Uh, so that's going to make a difference. And then a big one, and people don't think about, it, is the maturity. Uh, young plants, even if they're natives or, or uh, Mediterranean plants, they need frequent watering until they get established. Everything needs frequent watering until it gets established. Um, with even sod, uh, of course I don't have to say even sod, of course sod. Uh, if you think about sod, what is it? It's a plant, it's many, many plants, 
that had a root system as deep as 12 to 18 inches, it gets harvested. What's left? An inch, right? An inch, inch and a half, maybe probably an inch, of, an inch of root zone. When it had maybe uh, that's less than 10 percent. So imagine they try to compare it to like a newborn baby. What's what's the story with a newborn baby? They're hungry every. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. It's been a while since I, you know, I don't remember, but I think it was pretty pretty close. And why is that? Because they have a very small stomach. They're growing. They're they're you know they they have this constant need to be fed uh, because I think part of it's because they they're they're little. They don't have the capacity. As adults, we could eat once a day. We don't, but we could. Um, and so it's. I compare that to a, a newly harvested sod that you lay down, is it just lost 95% of its capacity to take in water. So what do you have to do? You, you have to water it often. Now the mistake a lot of people make when they put in new plants or new sod is they water way past the root zone. So what do you think, How let's say you have a spray system, you have this new sod lawn, new plants, but let's say new sod lawn is a specific example, how long do you think we need to water that lawn to keep it alive? Any, any guesses out there? I know they're just guesses. I'm not expecting you to know. Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Any other guesses? One minute. One minute? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Frequently. Okay, so if you, you think about it, since we only have an inch of soil, what's below the root zone isn't going to affect the health of that plant. So, so um, five minutes is going to get you, uh, depends on the type of soil and, and of course a spray system, five minutes will probably get you eventually uh, five, four or five inches down, let's say approximately. So um, you'll see in a, in a nursery setting, if you've ever been to a, a nursery where they do cuttings, they have a mister system that comes on maybe every five minutes, and it comes on for just a couple seconds. It just keeps the leaves wet. Well, we want to do a little bit more than keep the leaves wet on new sod. We want to get that first inch. So typically, we schedule for one to maybe two minutes, maybe four to five times a day. So, so all you're doing is replenishing the moisture that gets lost out of that first inch of sod because there's no roots yet that have gone down. Now, as time goes forward, the roots start to grow, then you start to increase the duration and reduce the frequency. But new sod, uh, and again, it depends on the time of year. Let's say it's, you know, it's 85 degrees outside to put new sod down, I would say minimum four times a day for very short periods. What happens is most people, even companies, turn it on, they run it for five minutes because that's what's on the clock automatically, that's the backup program, and they have a lake because they also water three or four times a day, but now you're putting 20 minutes worth of water down when you only need to put maybe four or five minutes worth of water over there. So what happens is then it, then you can actually cause a situation where the sod will die because it starts to rot. Yes? Well, it's interesting when you're saying all this, the other piece that always comes up that you said is time of day, you know, whether it's the middle of the night, early in the morning, late in the afternoon, does that come into play also when you are explaining this to your clients? Absolutely, but of course, uh, if we're talking specifically about new sod, time of day is off the oh, okay. off the board. You got to water. Um, you don't have to water at night with sod, but you definitely need to water during the day because it will dry out. Um, absolutely, though, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, um, when to irrigate? When best to irrigate? With a drip system, really doesn't matter. With any type of overhead system, it absolutely matters. And my rule of thumb, on, we'll go over it again, but it's, it's between midnight and about 6 a.m. is my favorite time. Um, a lot, I could water later in the morning, but most people are getting up taking showers and that affects your water pressure. And, and so uh, I don't want to, you know, I figure for most homes, uh, you have that six hour period is plenty of time to get your irrigation cycle done. Okay, so diving into water management, uh, how much should I water? That's, that's the big question. How often? You know, when you uh, have a home, 
It's not like there's this owner's manual right there <laughs> telling you. There's an owner's manual telling you what the temperature to set your refrigerator and your you know, stove and all that stuff. But irrigation, there's maybe a little scribble from the previous homeowner or the gardener wrote something down, but it's not like you have this amazing tool um, that, that comes with your irrigation control. It tells you how to program it, but it doesn't exactly tell you uh, what to put in there. Uh, so how deep should I water? How often, uh, how can I tell if I'm over or under watering and how many start times should I use? So who knows what start times are? Yeah, got a good with you. So this is something that's generally very underutilized. It's like having this nice powerful computer and we just use it for email. So it's the same thing with the irrigation controller. Uh, start times, um, the only time I don't use multiple start times, so let me first define what start times are. So start times are basically what you've programmed into the controller of how, uh, what time of the morning or the day that the, the uh, controller comes on and how many times it repeats that cycle. Uh, so this is a tidbit that I learned not that long ago, a few years ago, that I think is really important because a lot of people have spray systems. So what's a spray system? That's where a head pops up and just sprays. It doesn't rotate. It just covers the whole area all the time that it's on. That's a fixed spray system. That is the system that has the highest what we call precipitation rate. So that's where um, precipitation rate, the best way I can describe that, you may be familiar with this already, but like a, a, a light sprinkle to a heavy downpour. So a sprinkle, light sprinkle is low precipitation rate, heavy downpour, high precipitation rate. So a spray system is like a heavy downpour. If you ever got caught with the sprinklers on, you, you get the idea. You, it's not like you're just walking along and there's a little mist in the air. You, you get wet right away. So um, there's different types of soil, different infiltration rates. If you have a spray system, the general rule is, is you should never water more than five minutes at a time. So if you've got a spray system programmed for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you may need 15 minutes worth of water, but don't put it down all at once. And we're going to go into some detail about why that is ineffective. So that's why you use these start times. Is if you do need 15 minutes worth of water and you can only water for three minutes at a time, then you got to water five. You can do the math. You got to have five start times. Now, some controllers only have two or three start times. If you're ever in the market for an irrigation controller, what you want to find is one that has at least five and hopefully more. There are not that many on the market. Um, so the the um, the how much. Again, that's going to come based on all the different site conditions and the plants. How often is going to be based on the time of year. Yes? So when they, in the drought, when they say we can only water five minutes a day, um, is, so is it better to split that up into two and three, or it doesn't matter because it's so low anyhow? It, it's very likely that it's best to split it up, but again, it's going to depend on the type of system mm -hmm. you have. But yes, if I had a spray system and I was told I could water only five minutes a day, I would be watering for probably two minutes and I'd cheat a little and I'd water three times for two minutes. <laughs> who's out there with a stopwatch, right? Because um, you, you'll get, I mean, the, the main reason for multiple start times is because soil can only take up so much water per minute. You know, it can only take up a certain amount of volume. And the best way to describe it is if you take a, a sponge, and you put it under your faucet, and you run the faucet slowly, that sponge will not allow a drop of water out until when? Until it's saturated. Until it's saturated, right? So that's saturated, like saturated soil. Then, uh, um, then water will, will continue to go down. If you just turn the water on full blast, water is going to spray off the top of the sponge and into the sink. It's going to bypass it. So that's a high precipitation rate. Most soils, uh, you know, from clay to, to sandy soils, they can only take so much water. Of course, clay soils has to be much slower. Sandy soils can take it very quickly, but not as fast as a, a heavy downpour. So a spray system can overcome even pure sandy soil. And that's why I have that five minutes. They did sandy soil, level ground, 
what they found was is that it's the plant medium. So let's say it's sod or some other ground cover that will somewhat impede the uh, the water from going down in the soil after just a few minutes, after five minutes. So clay soils, that's where it's maybe one or two minutes with the spray system. Usually with spray systems. If you have clay soils, clay soils and spray systems do not mix. They're just a bad idea. Because you have to water, you'd have to water so many start times. And if you have a clay soil that's on a slope <laughs> with a spray system, I've seen it many times. That, that's just two opposite ends. You don't want to do that. You want to, slopes you've got to put down the water even much slower than you do on a level ground. Um, how can you tell if you're over or under watering? Um, same thing about how deep. Um, soil Moisture Pro is a great tool. Um, I recommend you get one, especially if you're going to be dealing with this on a regular basis, is you get one that's at least a couple of feet long. Wow. And the reason for that is, is most, like I said, sod, a good healthy sod can root up to 18 inches deep. Well, if you've got a Soil Moisture Pro that's only six inches long, like the one you can get in the garden store, well, you're not going to know what's going on down below. Um, of course, trees, mature shrubs, can be two, three feet. But the soil moisture probe I have is three feet long. Um, and, and, and you can probe an inch down, or you can probe 36 inches down. You can choose. Do you know where to get those? Because I've looked for them in that um, I bought mine online. I buy so much stuff online now. <laughs> um, but yeah, usually at commercial, um, Supply like Grand Joe's or uh, what's that? Horizon. 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 Yeah, the commercial suppliers. Uh, you can get them. We have in each one of our maintenance crews. They have one of these. It's it's like driving a car without a gas gauge. I mean, you, you got to have this. It's a, it's a really important tool if you're going to diagnose and deal with irrigation, drought stress, whatever. It's uh, it just reads the, it's an electrical conductivity, you know. Water conducts electricity and if there's moisture, it'll make a gauge move and if there's no moisture, it'll show that it's dry. It's a great tool for determining how far the water is getting down in the irrigation cycle. I mean, you can dig a hole too, but this, this you can just push right down to the soil. Um, okay, so when somebody asks me, and people are going to ask you, how much I be watering, this is the information you're going to need to know. So, uh, type of irrigation system, and they can't just answer automatic. It's an automatic irrigation system. <laughs> <laughs> That'll happen. Um, the uh, you, you've got to, you know, and just how I described the fixed spray head. That it's a where it, it, it doesn't rotate and it covers the area that it's covering 100% all the time. That's how you got to, to deal with it because most homeowners aren't going to have a clue. Well, yeah, it sprays. It's, it could be a rotor that sprays. So that's why I say, you know, a rotor head is a head that rotates. It's a spray head that rotates. Um, so, or is it a drip system? Is it a bubbler system? Uh, and we're going to, I'll show you some examples of each of these. But to understand that, because as I said, a, uh, a, a spray system puts out the most water. A rotor system is typically one third. Okay, so what I'm saying is, is for the same area, if you were to put little cups down and turn on the system, <coughs> a spray system will fill up those cups three times as quickly as a rotor system. So uh, as you can see, that's going to make a big difference on what you tell your, your client. Uh, in addition to the type of system, you know, the, the quality of that system, is it installed properly, is the right pressure, are the, are the heads aligned properly, are they the right spacing, do they all have match nozzles so that, you know, I'm sure you've all seen, you turn on an irrigation <coughs> system and there's an impact rotor, you know, the old Rainbird style uh, heads, there's, there's a drip line going to some pots, there's uh, a spray system, and then there's a regular gear-driven rotor, all on the same belt. <laughs> and you know, how do you how do you deal with that? 
it, it's, it's not easy. So, and especially if you're taking a call or somebody's you know, needing some help and, and you're trying to decipher what's going on, it, it, it's a challenge. So understanding what they've got in the ground, where they're located, as we talked about how different, um, typically uh, we're watering about 30% more than on the coast, just an inland valley. And then you get up into Ramona, the little old mountains, mm -hmm. and then maybe it's another, maybe it's 50% more than what it is in the, uh, on the coast. And then of course the deserts, it could be almost double or, or, or more. Um, the soil type and degree of slope. So I, I understand that you, you just took soils, and so you understand about the ribbon test, and, and you're, you've got a clue about the <laughs> sand, silt, clay composition. Uh, so as you know, that has a dramatic effect of how the, the soil can take in water, and then the degree of slope makes a really big difference. If it's really flat, you can water longer. If it's really steep, you're going to have to shorten up those run times. Uh, the time of year, as I said, uh, you know, a week ago, we weren't really using any water at all, very little uh, evaporation. And then yesterday and today, actually the day before, Sunday, I think it started, uh, all of a sudden, those plants are going to start using moisture. And really with an irrigation system, all we're doing is replacing the moisture that that plant lost. That's all we're trying to do, is basically create rain. Um, so, as you can imagine, during the winter, during the spring, summer, it's, it's going to vary. So, and, and you, you know, we're in California, so it's not like, okay, winter is from this point to this point, <laughs> summer is from this point. It, it varies, from, sometimes from one day to the next. So, it's, you know, there are some areas where it's pretty much, you know, uh, by this month, it's, there's going to be snow on the ground or, you know, whatever's going on. But, it just varies around here. Uh, and again, we talked about exposure. Um, when uh, you set up your irrigation system, if you have, let's say the client has a turf area in the front yard and the backyard, a lot of people just like to put all the turf on one, on, on, on one program, on the controller. And that comes on every three days. I do it more on the hydrozone. I look at that back lawn in the front lawn. <coughs> one is full sun and one is half sun. I'm going to have those on separate programs, and a program on the clock allows you to water set valves on different days, different frequencies. So, so um, I'll split it up based on, yeah, that lawn in the front is full sun, it needs to be watered every third day, and the lawn in the, the back is, or is only half sun, so I'm going to water that every four days. And that's, how, that's another way you can save water. Just because they're both lawns doesn't mean they go on the same program. Um, type of plants, of course, um, really important. Uh, the, the other thing that I, I want to really emphasize is your main goal with most all plant material is that you want to water as infrequently as possible. But, it, but when you do water, you want to water to the full depth of the root zone. So you want to, re, you want to, the reason you want to water the full depth of the root zone is that you want the roots to flourish and develop a really good network. And again, what are we doing? We're creating that bigger stomach. With a bigger stomach, we don't have to eat so often. <laughs> the plant will have less stress. Uh, very often I'll get a call from a client saying, or a prospective client saying, look, I'm calling you because I don't understand. I water my lawn every day. <laughs> and by 1 o'clock in the afternoon, there's burn spots, there's dry spots in my lawn. Okay, so you, you, what could it be? You think about it, well, maybe a sprinkler head's plug. Or uh, this or that, but most often what I find is he's already given me the answer of what the problem is. He's watering every day for five minutes. So that means that the first three inches of soil is wet. Okay, so what is this lawn, what do you expect I'm going to see when I take a shovel or my, my soil probe and I take out a core sample of soil, what, what am I going to find? Short roots. short roots. Short roots. And what do short roots give you? The plant only has so much capacity. Basically, 
It gets hungry starving at one o'clock in the afternoon when a, a healthy lawn could go three or four days. Okay, so that's what's going on is this, this person hasn't realized, but they've established a very shallow root system, a very small stomach for this plant. So the plant is unhealthy because as soon as it starts to get stressed, insects can attack it much more easily. Um, you know, any kind of disease can, can affect it. Just like if we don't get enough water, we don't get enough food, we are affected by disease. The plants are the same. So, so, and I can't just go over there and all of a sudden say, okay, we're only going to water once every three days. This guy's been watering once a day. We have to wean this lawn into a healthier system while well, those roots aren't going to grow in a, in a week. <coughs> Are you going to address the issue of what's in our water in terms of salt? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because sure. in San Diego, what do we have? And we have, most of our water comes from the Colorado River, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful river, but it's got a lot of stuff in it. Huh. Uh, if you ever get an opportunity to do a tour at, uh, at the filtration plant, which is Lake Skinner, anybody ever been to Lake Skinner? It's, you, you wouldn't believe what you see. There are, there are loaders, these tractors about the size of this room, with buckets that are, after the filtration process has happened, that they're taking buckets of this sediment that came in the water from the river, and they're selling it as soil amendment. Wow. Okay, well, that kind of gives you an idea, because, you know, if you, often you'll see a video of the Colorado River, and it's kind of a brown color. <clears throat> so that's all that material. Well, the, of course, once they filter it, there's still minerals in the water that don't get filtered out by the particulate uh, filters. And so, um, there, these minerals tend to collect uh, in, our, in our irrigation systems, uh, within the plant itself, you get tip burn. Mm -hmm. who, who here grows Japanese maples? Very susceptible to um, the calcium that's in the water. They burn, they tip burn. So they look mm -hmm. great right when they sprout out, which they're going to do shortly here, especially yes. with this weather. You're going to get your new leaves come out. But it's a very sensitive plant to having those, uh, all the, the extra goodies that come in our water. And um, usually, after a few months, it starts to show up to where the tips just start to die off, to burn. The leaf is still fine, the, the, the plant can survive, but it's not as pretty as it was right in the spring. And that's that accumulation. Uh, the other thing that you can see very evident, if you ever go into like a park or somebody's front yard where there's a tree in front of a spray head, that trunk of the tree is really light colored white, that's just the, the residue. because. Once the water evaporates, that sprays onto the tree, it leaves the minerals behind. Um, your faucets in your house, around the little aerator, you see the, the buildup. Um, that just is your little reminder that our water is imported. And, it, and uh, you know, people that don't get Colorado River water, um, they don't have these uh, buildups, you know, unless they have another source that has that. But, um, we, we get our, a lot of water comes from Sacramento, in the Delta, but way more comes from the Colorado River, and, and it varies. And you can sort of tell if you're really keen on it, you'll see the, the buildup can be worse at different times of the year, depending on where our water's coming from. So that's, that's what I, I see there. Um, Question? Yes. From the scenario that you were talking about, the person that calls that calls you up and says he's you know, he's got these bird genes. So you're saying that he's watering. What, what was he telling you? He's watering. He's watering every day for five minutes with a spray system. So what what I know already is I, I doubt that he has pure sandy soil. So I already know that some of the five minutes, a lot of the five minutes, or some portion, is not even getting to the roots. Okay. Um, so he should probably be watering. Let's say he has a loam soil, kind of a medium soil not sandy, not heavy clay, then I would probably be watering for maybe three minutes. So maybe close to 50% of the water that he's applying isn't getting in the plant. So the water's only going down a couple inches. So what we have to do is we have to promote root growth. So first we've got to find out what kind of soil he has. And what I like to do is soil test, a, a nutrient soil test. So we're testing uh, all the micro and macronutrients, we want, and, and the pH. We want to see um, that we've got a healthy medium to grow the plant in. And based on what type of turf he has, we know what, what 
that turf lights. Um, and let's say we get the soil toast back and it's not bad. It's just dry full of three inches. Then what we'll do is we might put a little fertilizer to promote root growth. We'll start, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put in multiple start times. We still may water every day. We'll probably have to because his lawn will die if we don't. But we'll take that five minute start time and we might cut it down to two minutes and we'll do it for four times, five times. Um, and then uh, maybe the following season, the following year, we will, we'll do a soil probe, we'll test to see how much deeper we've got in the root system. I mean, you'll know right away when you're doing a, using a coring tool for soil, if you can, if you push it and it only goes down an inch or two, you're pretty sure that huh. water's just not getting down any farther. If the soil's moist, usually you're going to be able to run that probe down pretty easily. So you're saying his main fault was that he was watering, that, that water was going in all at one time, and so um, the roots would or it was dry after when it got really hot in the afternoon and so the water just wasn't there <coughs> what, yeah what, what's happening is the roots will only grow where there's moisture yeah. you know what it reminds me of a professor I had at, at Cal Poly he put it right wrote it right on the board first day of school um, do plant roots search for water oh. and what's the answer no. yeah, yeah. I, I wish it was yes, because I said yes, but no. The key word is search. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. You know what anthropomorphic is? We're putting humanistic terms towards, towards non-human things. So they don't search. What happens is if they're growing and they happen to hit an area where there's moisture or a good growing environment, they, they grow prolifically. Where there's no environment for growth, they don't, they don't go there. They just they stop. <coughs> Uh, so, so the idea is what we're trying to do is establish an area where the roots will grow. Mm -hmm. What he was doing is not creating that. He was only creating an area three inches. We want to create an area at least a foot. So it's not that we need to immediately start watering, watering a foot deep, but we need to water deeper than three inches so those roots that are at three inches will want to grow down into four, five, six inches. And then once that root system develops, then uh, we can start to back off on the frequency. The microbe is later, I don't know, but I keep thinking about it. When you have these yards where they go to DG, cactus stuck in it, shrub dotted all over, and they're in a drip system. <clears throat> so what you're saying is that drip system is going to let out so much for that time the plant will live. You have a lot of dry land in between these things. So are you making a flower pot syndrome on these plants that you're going to limit what could be their maximum growth because they're only in this hole with this much water? Absolutely, you could do that. So a properly designed drip system is one that's designed for the availability to put water out uh, where the root zone can be for that plant. So there's plants, you know most people think trees have tap roots. There's only a few trees that actually have tap roots. Most trees, and, and you can see it, if you ever see a tree fall over, what's the, the bottom of the tree is flat. The roots are all going out this way, that way. Um, so, so you need to understand what you're planting. There are a lot of desert plants that have tap roots because they're, they're trying to get to groundwater. And then there's a lot of desert plants that have very shallow root systems, but very, they go very large distances away from the plant because when it rains, it rains very rarely, but when it rains, they're trying to get as much of it as they can. So understanding your plants and how they grow so when we put in a drip system, we either put in the coverage that will cover the mature plant, or there'll be a plan to come back in a year or two once the plant matures, and then we can add some emitters. But you're absolutely right. If you just put an emitter that only waters right there, and this plant has the potential to root much farther, it's going to be a weaker plant because it's not going to get the water. Again. So does the soil that's around it not getting water act like a sponge and interrupt the watery needs that the plant is supposed to get because it's so dry. That's a, that's a great yeah. observation that can happen. Um, when we put plants, new plants in the ground, what are, what are most plants planted in uh, from the nursery? What kind of plant mix do you see? It's a very light mix because first of all you got to transport the plant and they want the plant to grow quickly. They don't mind to water it regularly. Well, one of the biggest mistakes that happens is when people plant a uh, plant into the garden is that 
they don't realize that the, there's that action. When you've taken your soils class, you know that soils have an attraction for water. Okay, clay soils have a, a, an amazing attraction for water. So let's say you have a clay or a loamy soil that you're putting your pot into. You have this pot with a super light soil. It's nice and wet. You water it. What can happen? That surrounding soil can literally suck the water right out of your new plant and kill it. <laughs> that's what will happen. So what's critical, and especially with drip systems, a lot of people say you can't use drip systems with natives, or you can't use drip systems with drought tolerant plants. And, and the reason they say that is because it eventually it'll rot, if you have an emitter near the base of the plant, it'll rot the base of the plant, which is absolutely true. But I told you that I'm a big proponent of drip, and we've been installing drought tolerant gardens since I started my business. Well, well, I learned what to do. What you do is, any new plant, you've got to get water right on the root ball. Because if you water to the side, well, that a soil that's more attracted to the water is going to not allow that water to get to your plant. So you have to have the emitter right on the root ball. But what I've done is I've designed it to where it's on a piece of microtubing, spaghetti tubing, for three months until the plant roots, and then the crew comes back and rotates the emitter away from the root ball because I don't want to rot that stem. So that's the way I've been able to grow natives, drought tolerant plants on a drip system successfully <coughs> because I don't think there's any more efficient way to do it. Yes? So then if you're talking one emitter near the root ball, three months later you're moving that one emitter to the side, are you then adding another emitter okay, on the good, other good side question. of the plant? <coughs> Or do you add four? So we, we actually pre-install them because um, we put in thousands of sure. plants. So what we would do is we, um, you have your plant. If it's a one gallon, it's one emitter. If it's a, if it's a five gallon, it's two emitters on the root ball. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, an emitter on, uh, on either side of the root ball that's in the native soil. We know that plant's going to root into the native soil, hopefully within a few weeks, if not a couple of months. And so that soil will be ready and waiting moist for the roots to grow into it. So that's, that's the way we plant it. So there's already pre-installed emitters beyond the root, so current root ball. So it's linear then, one, two, three, four. Right. And if it's a large shrub, we'll, do, we'll circle it. Or if it's in a mass planting, we may have another la linear line a couple feet away. So it just depends on the situation. But excellent question. It, uh, uh, but as I, as I said before, the, the critical thing is that even with a spray system, if the spray system doesn't reach the root ball of that plant, you put this new plant in the ground, it looks great, and then in a couple of days the thing dies. Yeah. Because that soil has more of an attraction than the soil that's in the pot. That's what it is. You, you know now more than most people out there in the last few years. <laughs> um, the other trick is, is when you're putting in a new plant is that, as you can imagine, if you get the garden soil, the native garden soil on the top of the root ball of that plant, that will also kill the plant. Because now there's no way for the water that you're irrigating with to get to the, the loose soil that's in the pot because that heavier soil is going to pull the moisture away out into the side. So we always plant the plant at least a half inch above the native soil. You don't want to go too high because you don't want to stress out the plant. You don't want to go level because the plant can settle a little bit and soil can easily slough onto the, uh, the container mix. So when you know you've got a successful installation when your plant is in the ground planted and you can still see the, the uh, mulch or the, the, the light planter mix that that plant came with on the surface. If that's covered up, you know you've got a problem. Right. Stephen, another thing that's good to do is when you do dig your hole, you fill it with water and let it drain through into your soil so you're not putting a wet one gallon pile. Right, into, it yeah. won't sponge out as right. quickly. Right. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that it tells you, if you fill it full of water and it doesn't drain, yeah. you've got other problems. Yeah, right. um, you know, there's a general rule that if you fill up a hole and it takes uh, more than a day to drain down, you got problems. You, yeah. you either need to solve that drainage problem or you need to buy very specific plants that like wet feet. And there's not very many of them that do. But, 
yeah, if that if that soil is so non-porous that it holds like a bathtub, then yeah. I mean, I, I kind of joke about it. You know, people they go looking for a house and they they want you know a house with the porch or they want fireplaces. I go around. I I go testing the soil. <laughs> Do I want to live here? And the house I have right now, it's like a dream. It's oh. just it's just loam and there's no rocks. Oh, wow. I can, I don't need oh, a stick. I just take, I didn't use my foot. I can just dig a hole or so. That's a prime use of real estate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just makes gardening and your work so much easier. Yeah, it, it, plants just grow like crazy. Steve, you know? do you yeah. know from experience what areas in San Diego has that soil? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. um, you know, usually what you'll find it's the really old neighborhoods yeah. before yeah. earth movers were invented. Oh, yeah. um, oh my God! So as you can imagine, especially with San Diego being developed as it is. It's so rare for us to get a project like that. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, I mean, unless it's a remodel. Remodels, we, you know, most contractors remodels are really tough because stuff's already in the ground and you know, there's gas lines and concrete and things buried that you can't believe. New houses, it's it's a blank slate except the soil is horrible. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, I think the best developer in the world if they ever came around would be one that scraped off the topsoil, did their grading, and then relayed the topsoil. But, that's not going to happen. It's going to be way too expensive. Moving soil costs a fortune. So uh, yeah, the only times where we have that opportunity, and it, it's like a dream for the crew. They just uh, where where you can find, you know, like in Vista, and there's just certain areas where they just put houses right on, you know, on the terrain. They had to just cut a path for the house, but the rest of the area is natural terrain. And again, it's old soil versus new soil. Uh, we're exposing when they do this grading. You're exposing soil that may have not seen the light of day for a million years. There's just there's no there's no organic matter, no biological stuff going on in soil. And one of our jobs is to get that started. And that's really by doing a soil test and finding out what's missing. Because there's another big misnomer. Oh, if you're planting natives, don't. Don't do anything, just stick it right in the ground. Well, if the pH is off and there's no nutrients whatsoever, a native is not going to do well. So my rule of thumb is just know what you're doing. So many right, so many landscapers, what do they do? Oh, we're gonna get some manure and some gypsum. Uh, you know, I mean, there may be more calcium in that soil than you ever want, and they're putting more down because that's what you put down. So, what I was taught in my soil science class is just take a sample, send it in, get it analyzed, get the full test done, and then there's no guesswork. It says you need two, me, three pounds of this per thousand square feet. You need this, and sure, if it's natives. Don't go throwing a bunch of organic matter. They don't need that. But they still need the basics of a right, proper pH. Um, one of the things that I learned in, in, with soils is pH is probably the most important thing. Because you can have iron, all these wonderful micronutrients in the soil. If the pH isn't at the right level, the plant will not be able to get to those nutrients. So you might be fertilizing every day with iron, and there's tons of iron in the soil, but the plant can't take it up because the pH is off. So, I mean, if you did only one test, it would be the pH. What is the ideal pH, Steve? What's that? In your experience, what's the best range? Um, six and a half to seven. Six to seven, I should say. And we're, you know, some plants are more sensitive than others. And you'll see that too. You'll go into a garden and and there's like half the plants or three quarters of the plants aren't really doing well and there's two or three or they're, they're just going like crazy and you'll find that that plant just has a much broader range of pH or it can take alkaline or acidic soils work but most plants six and a half is probably the, the best number but you know it's going to be a range uh, we've done pH tests where it's nine I mean you have pH of nine not much of anything is going to grow no. And you're rarely going to get low pHs around here. We have alkaline soils too. Right. Yeah. So should the pH soil be taken, if you want to send it in to get it tested, be taken on the foot into the ground? Um, typically what, 
what's recommended is you, you dig a hole. First you dig a hole and then you take a slice of the side of that hole. So you're trying to get um, not just the top, not just the middle of the bottom, you want to get the whole thing. Um, and it depends on what you're planting and what, what's going to be growing there. So if I'm planting 72-inch uh, box trees, then yes, I'm going to want a, a slice of a, a very tall hole. If I'm only planting sod, then I'm, you know, I'll probably go down maybe a, a foot. So you don't go as far as the roots will eventually go, or you? Um, or not you typically. I mean, okay. I guess you could. There's no uh, harm in doing that. Um, the the thing is, is you're not generally going to amend uh, a foot down. Uh, most uh, tillers or even shoveling in is going to be maybe six inches. Again, what we're trying to do is reestablish this cycle of soil, this soil biology. So, because an area has been graded and now you have soil that hasn't seen the light of day for a long time, that soil biology is just not there. And you're not going to, I mean, unless you've got an limited budget, you're typically going to be working with that six inches. Sure, if you're going to put in tree and, or shrubs, you can amend the backfill, but I'm talking about just general amending the area for ground covers, plants. Um, you, want, you want to um, get that in a condition to where the roots will grow, and then eventually, over time, plants create their own organic matter, right? The roots grow, the roots die, leaves drop, and but it you got to get the cycle started, so that's what you're doing by doing a soil test and amending the soil. Is you're you're getting that thing rolling along. Once you get plants growing in that soil, then they'll start to grow into that native soil that you haven't disturbed yet, and then eventually you get more and more of it. What we call a topsoil. So you know, I cheated. I just found an old house that had really great soil all the way down. So I don't. And I mean, I planted this garden. I didn't put any fertilizer, any organic matter, nothing. Just put the plant in the ground, grows. The only thing I added was a nice thick layer of mulch over the top. And, and is the procedure for your soil test the same as pH the the side of yeah. the hole? Yeah, the soil sample is basically that. And what you want to do is go several areas in the yard. If you find that the soil is pretty similar, then just take samples all over, put it in one bag, send it in. If you find, which is common nowadays, you have clay over here and sand over there, loam over there, then it might be a good idea to kind of figure out where those areas are and do separate soil tests because you got, you got uh, that happens once in a while to us. It's kind of a pain. Um, any other questions? Where are you? Where am I? I'm right here. <laughs> Where's my house? I live in Escondido. <laughs> Born and raised. I can't believe I'm still living there, but I mean, I, I, oh, I can tell you a little joke. I, uh, one of the uh, downfalls of, of uh, living in the town where you were born and raised is I'm at the DMV. This was a long time ago. I, mean, I was probably 25, 30 years old. I'm at the DMV, and I'm going to redo my license. And the, the lady behind the, the counter looks, looks at my license, looks at me. And you know, there's people everywhere, right? There's a long line. She said, she just looks at me and says, I used to change your diapers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's good parts and there's bad parts. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not what a 25 year old guy wants to do. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so we've talked about all this. So time of day to water, generally between midnight and, uh, and about 6 in the morning. You can go later, if, you know. I, see, I'm a contract. I get up at 4.30, so I, you know. Other people get up at 9 or 10 o'clock. I don't know who they are. <laughs> um, programs, again, programs are so you can delineate this water is twice a week, this water is four times a week. That's the where programming comes in. Start times is what time of day it's going to come on and how often you're going to repeat that cycle. So it's closely related to the term cycles. Run times, of course, that's the duration. So when you set the clock for five minutes to run or 20 minutes to run or an hour, whatever it is, that's uh, the run time. Days of week or skip dates. So uh, on a lot of controllers, you have this option of even days, odd days, days of the week or skip days. My favorite is this one, is uh, 
is skip days. And the reason I like skip days is because we have an odd number of days in a week. And so if you want to water every other day, you have to start you know, working at this and that way. But if you just say, I want to water every other day, then it's not a problem. And the newer controllers, which are pretty nice, is let's say you're, the city says you can't water on Wednesdays. Or the, let's say the maintenance company comes on Wednesdays and you don't want the lawn wet. Well, you can tell the clock to skip, even though you're using skip days, say skip days, but don't water on Wednesday. So it'll either the water the day before or the day after. So I'm a big fan of that because when, let's say that it warms up like it does, it was doing fine at twice a week, all you have to do is say now water three times a week. You don't have to go and reset, okay, what days am I going to water or not water? So. I, I really promote that. Some people just like to know, hey, it's Mondays and Fridays, or you know, whatever floats your boat. But I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. <coughs> and then there's the water budget setting, which um, finally <laughs> they're starting to listen. I don't know if they listened to me or they heard somebody else, but <laughs> irrigation controller manufacturers use this water budgeting. All it does is modify the duration. So instead of Let's say you set your, your drip system for 45 minutes and you know you, you, you have 100% of waters for 45 minutes. Well, if you go to 200% of waters for 90 minutes. Well, I think what's more important is not, as I told you, you want to water to the root zone. I don't care if it's winter, summer, spring, or fall. You want to water to the depth of the root zone. So why would you want to mess with the duration? What you want to do is change the frequency. How often do you reapply the water that the plant lost? Well, there's some controller manufacturers that are finally seeing the light after about 20 years, and they're realizing that yeah, that's what we need to change. And how often does it come on, not how long it runs. So um, I'm not a big fan of water budgets just for that reason that most controllers adjust your run times and not your frequency. Okay, so irrigation systems. So of course the hose, you know, it's it's the it's if you're really good at it, it's probably the most efficient, if you really know what you're doing. Um, but most people turn on the hose and then they forget about it, and that's not very efficient. Uh, it's, it runs. Of course, spray, like I said, it's a fixed, this is a pop-up spray. There's, there's, there's sprays on risers for shrubberies, and then there's lawn pop-ups. Um, Gear-driven rotor, so that's, that's a, a head that has a stream or streams that rotate. And so it means you can be standing behind the head and not get wet, but eventually it'll come around and get you wet. This head, you're going to get wet, period. Uh, impact rotor, so that was really the first rotor that came out, a mechanical rotor. Uh, the only problem with that is uh, the, uh, the distribution is very uneven because it uses uh, a slamming motion of this little bar which kicks water behind the head, throws it in places where you don't want it. Um, you probably haven't heard of the WIC system. My professor at Cal Poly invented that, which I thought was really brilliant. We'll talk about that. And then, uh, of course, the drip system. And a true drip system is not a mini sprinkler system. It's something that water slowly drips out of a device onto the uh, soil or, or even below grade. Um, and that's as you can imagine why it's so efficient is because evaporation, you know, it's going to happen here, it's going to happen in all, in, in this system, in this system. Um, if you have your pressure is too high, uh, you get misting, we've all seen that, where you can actually see it floating away. Um, so, uh, of course, too high of a pressure in a drip system can cause lines to blow out and, and all that. So, uh, pressure regulation is really important. First thing we do um, when we're uh, looking at a project is we, I bring myself out um, my soil probe, uh, a water pressure gauge. I want to identify where the meter is, what type of main line is coming off of it, uh, how long the run is, what the static water pressure is. So who knows the difference between static and dynamic water pressure? Want to share it with? So static pressure is... Uh, dynamic pressure is, water, is when the pressure of the water when it's moving, and yeah. static pressure when it's not. Excellent. Water in motion, dynamic, <laughs> static just means you're just, nothing's on, you're just checking the water. So so easy way to check static water pressure is you put a water a pressure gauge on a hose bib, uh, you turn it on, and the gauge will read a certain pressure. 
Now the reason that we measure dynamic water pressure is because when water starts to move through a pipe or a hose, it loses energy, which is pressure, because of friction. You know, and, uh, it's just a, a fact of life. Uh, and you want to know what the pressure is going to be at the sprinkler head. So this head is designed to have about 20 to 30 psi at the head. If you're running it at 40, you have that missing. If you're running it at uh, 15 psi, the water droplets get real heavy and your distribution gets really uneven. So that means you're putting too much water here and no water there. So you need to understand from the manufacturer what the optimum working pressure is. So uh, that's, and then with a the drip system, it's the same thing. You don't want the pressure too high or too low, although drip systems give you a much broader range. Uh, rotor system, commonly, uh, uh, standard water pressure for rotor is between 40 and 100 psi. So they take a much higher pressure to operate properly. Some of the water pressure is used to, to rotate the, uh, the head. Unlike that, it's in an internal gear, so there's no water spraying anywhere. It just turns a little gear, which causes the head to move, and all that water still runs through the nozzle and goes to where you want it. So these can be um, 60 to 75 percent efficient. They might be getting closer to 80 nowadays. They're really working hard, the engineers. Again, this is about 50 to 60. Very commonly, we'll go out to a project, these are like 30% efficient wow. because they're tilted, they've got different nozzles, they're spaced too far apart. I mean, you know, a lot. But this is the most common head that you're going to find. Um, the, uh, like I said, the drip system is, is somewhere in the 90s. Uh, and again, mainly because runoff is pretty much eliminated. Uh, that you don't have misting. Uh, you know, you put water right where the soil is. And, and the other thing is, what I like about drip systems is, you know, when you put in a young garden, with a spray system, everything works great, but then the plants grow up and then block the yeah. rain pattern. Yeah. So your efficiency yeah. just goes way down. With a drip system, it doesn't matter how big the, the plants get, you're just you're soaking the ground. Mm -hmm. Now you may need to expand it because maybe the roots have grown into areas that you didn't originally design the system, but at least you're not blowing water up against the house, on the sidewalk, against the car. Uh, and then the wick system was invented primarily to deal with uh, dry spots in lawns. So uh, where you, it has a matched precipitation rate, so it puts out the same coverage of water as a spray system, as this. So if you have a spray system and for whatever reason you've got this really odd spot that needs more water, maybe there's tree roots there, taking water out of the lawn, or maybe it's just a hard area to cover. Uh, my professor invented this to where you can connect it into this line, and it, it has, a, a, like I said, a, a rate of flow that's similar to a spray head, and it's just a piece of, uh, there's a, like a little bubbler adapter, and this little piece of microtubing comes off. It's actually, it's not microtubing. It's, you're familiar with mini sprinklers on a drip system? It's a real <laughs> stiff riser. That's what gets used here. You, you cut it off just at the surface of the sod. You connect it into your spray system with this uh, special uh, flow restrictor that causes it the same precipitation rate as this. And what he discovered, you can only do this in a sod. It can't be on bare ground. But within a sod, it's like the sponge, where you take the sponge and you put it under your faucet, the whole sponge will get saturated before it allows water to come out. With a piece of sod, it's the same way. If you put water slowly enough on a piece of sod, the whole piece of sod gets wet before water will go down below. And it was a great way to eliminate dry spots, but then we started doing it on new lawns. So I've installed a couple of new lawns with this system, and it's, it's uh, very effective. It works really well. So. Why would you want mini sprinklers on a drip system? Good question. I only like them for one purpose, and that's for establishment. So if I'm putting in a ground cover that eventually will work really well off a drip system, but there's no way it's going to survive because I'm not going to have an emitter for every plant that's planted every six inches, then I'll put in my drip system and then I'll temporarily install mini sprinkler risers. And then once the plant gets rooted, I cap those off. People like to use them because I think, I've had clients like this, they, 
If they don't see that water flying through the air, they are just <laughs> not satisfied. <laughs> Um, we use the inline drip probably most of the time. The only I don't the only time I use any of that spaghetti is just for what I talked about before, where uh, if it's for a pot or if it's to establish a native or drop tolerant plant. I'm not a big fan of spaghetti tubing. I don't like the, the multi outlet emitters. I, I, I'm not a big fan of those because the tubing tends to move around. I like to use the half inch tubing. Emitters get placed either directly on the tubing or I buy the pre-installed tubing. And I, I base it uh, on the factor of if I'm doing a, a plant event where there's just mass planting, then I'll use the inline emitters because I, I don't have any big open areas. But if I have fruit trees or shrubs that are 10 feet apart, then I'll use the regular tubing and I'll just install emitters around the tree. And then I will have nothing in between because I don't... One of the things that really saves water with a drip system is that you're not irrigating in areas where you don't need to. With a spray system, you're going to irrigate everywhere. And, and that's another reason why it can be so efficient. Because you imagine, instead of watering, let's say, the area of this room, um, if you've got 15 shrubs that will eventually mature, it, at maturity cover the, the whole area of this room, you're only watering in 15 places instead of 100% of the area. So maybe you're watering 10 or 15% of the area and getting the coverage that you need. That's where you can really save on the trip. Versus spray. Yes? I have kind of two questions. For turf that's on a slope, it tends to dry out at the top and not be lush at the bottom. Is there any way to address the top? Absolutely. Absolutely. Usually what you'll see is that the irrigation cycle is too long, so the water is running downhill. Uh -huh. Slopes, you've got to just start decreasing those run times, making sure that you have, if you have these heads, you you can switch them out with an MP rotator because, again, that, without even having to change the head, you just change the nozzle. And then now you're putting one third of the amount of water down, so it goes down slowly. The other thing is, is on a slope, you should never have the heads at the bottom of the slope. They should always be up a foot or two because that water coming out of those heads is always going to run downhill. So why put the head at the bottom and then it just runs onto the sidewalk or whatever is below the slope? So those are a couple of tips. Yes? Why aren't there uh, water measuring uh, sub-meter type uh, devices readily available for the home market? Oh, well, I mean, you can buy them. I would say uh, probably because of the expense. Um, what I typically do is I want to know what they're using in the house. So that's pretty easy to, I mean, there's been studies that the average uh, person uses between 50 and 75 gallons a day per person in the house, so you can just use that as a multiplier. You could just shut off the irrigation system and see what the house uses in a, in a few days without completely stressing out the lawn. And then you just subtract that from your usage. No, that's too complicated. So if you talk about community gardens or school gardens or any place that you need, you want to know what water is going to that right. area, it should be really, really, you know, engineering straightforward to just put yeah. a device on there to measure the number of gallons that are going. Most there. commercial properties, um, the, there are there is a sub meter. There's a separate meter for irrigation, especially because they have to pay sewer fees based on water right. usage. Right. 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 But for a homeowner, you can buy a meter. I mean, the, you know, you have to buy a water meter and then you plumb it in. You could do it. It's available to you. It's just not readily. It's not like the government's. Uh, no, meter. look, we have these complicated devices to run the irrigation system. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me that you can't have a simple device <coughs> that you connect to your hose or you connect to your, uh, 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 right after your valves. You can measure the amount of water. I, I'll, after the break, I will I'll explain how to do that. It's pretty okay, easy to do. Okay, we're in the break right now, like 15 minutes, and please be back in your seats.